All right, folks, welcome to AP Microeconomics. This is day one, and uh, today we're going to start off by looking at some basic economic concepts to get our hands around before we get too far into the class. And so we're going to look at opportunity cost, marginal analysis, and an idea known as comparative advantage. And all this material is in your book at the beginning, chapters one and two. The page numbers are listed on the screen as well as in the uh, lecture notes that are posted on Blackboard. Uh, the first thing we want to do is make sure that we're clear on what our goals are here, and that is to make sure that we have an understanding um, of what opportunity cost is and how it's measured, how to identify it on a production possibilities curve. Um, we'll talk about what marginal analysis is. You should be able to uh, be able to apply it to some real life scenarios, and we'll talk about uh, comparative advantage. And you should be able to identify a the difference between a absolute and comparative advantage and be able to explain why trade is a beneficial uh, thing to happen within any economy. So we'll start off with this idea of opportunity cost. And opportunity cost comes out of this concept that uh, we live in a world with scarcity and choice. That what we want is limited but our wants themselves are unlimited. So in a world where we have unlimited wants but limited resources we have to make a choice because n everything that we want doesn't exist. And so we have to figure out a way to allocate resources so that we get the most uh, benefit at the least cost. And so we have to make difficult decisions. And because we have to make difficult decisions, uh, we have to be able to identify what the right decisions uh, ought to be. Our whole life is built around trade-offs. And so uh, when we have to give up something, uh, that's what we call an opportunity cost. So anytime that I choose to do one thing or purchase one good at the expense of another, then the next best alternative is what I would identify as being my opportunity cost. So if I choose to study uh, for a test instead of watching television, and that would be my next best thing, then the opportunity cost of getting a good grade would be the time that I could have spent watching TV. Uh, another example might be if you're at a restaurant and you're trying to decide what to get off of the menu and um, you, you, you would like two different meals but you can only order one, then the opportunity cost of the meal that you eat is the meal you gave up. So we live in this world where we're constantly making choices and we're giving up one thing for another. So when, when we uh, look at something like a poss production possibilities curve, we can begin to identify what opportunity cost is and put a number on it. So in this example, we've got two products we could be making. We could be making army trucks or cars. And the production possibilities curve tells us all of the possible combinations of trucks and cars that can be produced in this economy. So we could make 12 trucks and no cars. We could make three cars and no trucks or any other combination between those. So point B would say 10 trucks and one car. Part, uh, point C would be we can make six trucks and two cars. Now point E is not attainable. We don't have the resources and the ability to reach that yet unless there's some sort of economic growth. Whereas point F is something we could make but it's not considered efficient because we could be making more of both cars and trucks. If we were producing at point A, where there are 12 trucks and no cars, then moving to point B would leave us with an opportunity cost of two trucks. And the way we can figure that out is by saying, if I give up, or if I produce one car, I'm giving up two trucks. So the opportunity cost of producing one car is two trucks when we move from A to B. If I was to move from point B to C, then the opportunity cost would for one car is equal to four trucks. In order to get one car, I gave up four trucks. And if I was to go into move from point C to point D, then I would give up, uh, I would be giving up roughly six trucks for one car. So the opportunity cost moving from C to D of adding one car is six trucks. Like I said, point B is efficient it is maximizing our production. Point F is inefficient because I could be making more of both. And point E is not attainable unless there's some sort of long-term growth that occurs. This other concept is one of marginal analysis. And in e microeconomics in particular, we constantly talk about things as on the margins. We want to know 
whether or not decisions we make make economic sense. And so we look at marginal benefit and marginal cost. Anytime you see marginal, what it's talking about is the the uh, additional change that occurs by by um, the change of one uh, one one factor or um, or variable. So with marginal benefit, it's the additional happiness I get for one more item. And marginal cost is the additional cost I receive for doing one more thing. Uh, so an example would be like eating donuts. If I eat a donut and I get 10 units of happiness for the first donut, um, and, and, and it only costs me uh, one unit of unhealthiness, then that would make sense for me to eat because I get more happiness than the cost. The second donut I eat will make me happy, but by not as much because I've already had the first donut. So maybe it only brings me eight units of happiness. Uh, but that second donut also kind of adds to my health costs. So maybe I, the second donut leads to two, um, negative two for my health. And, and we could keep eating donuts and the donuts would make us happy, but the additional happiness would begin to dwindle the marginal benefit of each additional donut would begin to get smaller and the cost of each additional donut would begin to get larger and so we would stop eating donuts when the marginal benefit the additional happiness of the last donut I eat is equal to the marginal cost um, of that last donut so as long as marginal benefit is greater than marginal cost it makes economic sense to to take an action or purchase a good or consume a good. When marginal cost is greater than marginal benefit, you should stop. So if we think at the margins and we look at watching a movie, we can say the first time I go to the movies, I get $30 worth of happiness, and it only costs me $10 to get in the door. If I watch the movie a second time, I might get $15 worth of happiness. There's some stuff that I saw that I really liked and wanted to see again, or maybe there was something I missed that I caught the second time, but it's not like watching it for the first time because I know how it's going to end. So I get a little less benefit, but it still only cost me $10. The third time, I get $5 worth of benefit because I know all the jokes. I know exactly what's going to happen. There's not a whole lot new to me, but it's still kind of enjoyable, but it cost me $10 to get in the door. In that case, we look and we say, well, total benefit, I got $50 worth of happiness out of watching the movie three times. It only cost me $30. So when you're looking at total benefit, it seems like, okay, the going the third time to the movies makes tons of sense. But the reality is that that third time was not cost effective because it cost me five bucks to see it. Or five, I got five dollars worth of happiness, but it cost me ten to see it. So that's that's really I'm losing five dollars. So in that case, looking at marginal analysis, despite the fact that my total benefit out of all three times I go see the movie is greater than my total cost, that third time I watch the movie is not economically viable, and so I'll, I will only go see the movie twice. The last concept we want to look at is comparative versus absolute advantage. When we say that somebody has an absolute advantage, it means that they can make more of something than somebody else. Um, and when we talk about comparative advantage, what we say is that it, it is the opportunity cost is lower for one person to produce a good than another person. So let's just take a quick look at an example. We'll say a fish story, fish and chips. If we look at the data that we've got, we find that if you're in England, the English people can create 80 fish and zero chips, or they can make 20 chips and zero fish, or some sort of combination in between. In the U.S., we can produce 100 fish and no chips, or 50 chips and no fish. So these are our two production possibilities curves, and every combination in between. If we're trying to figure out the opportunity cost for England, then we can say the opportunity cost of making fish is how many chips per fish do I give up. In this case, if I make 20 chips, I could have had 80 fish. So if I choose to make 20 chips and no fish, then I, that's one decision. The alternative would be 80 fish and no chips. So I would say that 20 uh, fish per 80 chips sorry, 20 chips per 80 fish would leave us with an opportunity cost of one and a one quarter chip per fish. Meaning, in order to produce one unit of fish, I'm giving up one quarter unit of chips. Their opportunity cost of making chips then is how many 
fish are they giving up per unit of chips created? The good news is that once you calculate one opportunity cost, the other is the inverse. So if the opportunity cost of, for England of making fish is a one quarter chips, then the opportunity cost of making chips is four fish. For the U.S. then, the opportunity cost of making fish is that they, they give up 50 chips if they're to produce 100 fish. So the opportunity cost of one fish for the U.S. is one half chip. For every unit of fish they make, they're giving up a half a unit of chips. And then the inverse is true for their opportunity cost of chips, that they are giving up two fish for every unit of chips that they make. So when we look at comparative advantage versus absolute advantage, we would say that the absolute advantage in making fish belongs to the United States. We can make 100, England can make 80. So we make more than them, that's an absolute advantage. When it comes to making chips, the U.S. has an absolute advantage. We make 50, England makes 20. So we can make more than them. We still trade with England, however, because there is a comparative advantage here. England has a comparative advantage in the production of fish because they only give up a quarter unit of chips for every fish they produce. Whereas the United States loses a half a unit of chips for every fish they produce. So the U.S., even though they can produce more, is not as efficient in the production of fish um, relative to chips as England. So if England has a comparative advantage in one, that means the U.S. has a comparative advantage in the other. And so the U.S. is more efficient at the production of chips. We give up only two fish when we make a unit of chips, whereas the English give up four units of fish when they make up a unit of chips. So we have a comparative advantage in one, and they have a comparative advantage in the other. This is important because it explains why we bother to trade with them at all. So without trade, English make 20 fish, 15 chips, just as an example. And the U.S. can produce 50 fish and 25 chips, so the total production would be 70 fish and 40 chips. With trade, England could, say, make 80 fish and no chips, and the U.S. could make no fish and 50 chips, and suddenly we find that there is a greater total production in the economy by choosing the trade than without trade. And then we could actually come up with a scenario then in which the English would have 25 fish and 20 chips and the U.S. would have 55 fish and 30 chips because that gets us our maximum production possible. And you'll notice that in this situation, the U.S. has five more fish than they would have without trade, five more chips than they would have had without trade, and the same for England. So everyone is better off by specializing in those areas, producing those goods, where you have a comparative advantage. So the U.S., even though it can produce more on its own than England can on its own, is still better off by trading because of this idea of comparative and absolute advantage. And we're going to do some more practice and work on this. This is a real challenging concept. It's one that's going to take some time. Um, so we're going to practice some more when you're in class, and we'll see you then.